but, <laughs> but there is a reason, and over time, like, I really hope that you'll appreciate this. It might not even be during this class, right? It might be like two years from now, but you're like, I'm so glad I know that, or that I can think about that. So um, anyway, let's move forward with lectures. So we're going to start out with um, something that is um, many of you enjoy the products of, which is fermentation. So, <laughs> so this is occurring under anaerobic conditions. Uh, it's not uh, sorry. All right, so basically, just to orient, I try to orient you guys. So we had talked about glucose going to pyruvate in glycolysis, which was 10 reactions that you will know, um, right? And we had, then we have pyruvate, and it can go through the citric acid cycle, which we're going to talk about more in coming lectures, all the way to CO2 and water under aerobic conditions. But under hypoxic, which is low oxygen, Right, hyper is like a lot of too much, um, more than usual. Hypo is under or low, or anaerobic, no oxygen. You can actually have um, fermentation where you're getting ethanol, and you can also have um, conditions where you're going to get lactate. So um, basically, under aerobic conditions, right, we're going to recycle, deliver the electrons to oxygen as the final electron acceptor, um, and then we have. Recycling and ADP. We'll go back over this again. But then for anaerobic conditions, right, the NAD has to be recycled by other means like fermentation. So pyruvate is going to go to ethanol, pyruvate is going to go to lactate. Right now we're going to talk about how that happens so we get more details. So, what about formation of ethanol? So, this can be done by yeast, as we know, and some bacteria. So, the major reaction is that you have. Pyruvate going with pyruvate decarboxylase. This is irreversible. Um, the text, the textbook is okay now, but actually the instructor material had a mistake. So this is like the thing that I can put in was wrong. So I had to fix catch that and fix it. But it's irreversible. It uses a cofactor called thiamine pyrophosphate, and basically you're cleaving off this CO2 group to make acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is actually toxic in the cell, so you don't want it to accumulate. So actually, if you can't process this well, um, using alcohol dehydrogenase to make ethanol, um, you can like have flushing and other responses. So people who don't have, um, who have a weak allele of the alcohol dehydrogenase gene and mutation that makes it less effective, can't process pyruvate into ethanol as well. Um, and this can actually build up and be kind of toxic. So what is this? We all know this if you're into beer, champagne, wine, right? All of these are results of fermentation to produce the alcohol, the ethanol. Um, and the CO2 you, you see as the bubbles. Um, and then also with dough rising, if you're not into that aspect of fermentation, right? You actually take your packet of active yeast, which has usually it has sugar in there to help it. Um, and then you're adding the water, you're adding some other um, resources of glucose in terms of your starting flour and materials, and then you're producing CO2, which is getting the dough to rise. So one of the things that's kind of fun about this um, is to think about uh, actually how you make beer and what the limits are. So the limit of the actual alcohol content is limited by the yeast. And so beer yeast usually can handle 5 to 6% ethanol. And the ethanol um, impacts actually the membranes of the yeast. And so there have been some strains that have been developed that are more tolerant. And in those cases, they usually have modifications that affect the membrane structure. And for example, Sam Adams has a brew called, which I haven't tried yet, called Utopia which is like each year it's a different, you can actually Google it and it'll say what the alcohol content is that year, but um, it can be up to 28%. And they use a number of different types of yeast 
that are more resistant to alcohol, including champagne yeast. So champagne have a, tends to have a higher alcohol content, and also wine can get up to 15%. So if you decide to go into, uh, for a long time, right, these were proprietary, but now with sequencing being so easy, you can actually try to isolate those yeast sequence, figure out from many different strains where you can get higher alcohol content. Uh, what was responsible for that mutation or those sets of mutations that allowed you to have higher alcohol content. So next time you're um, having beer, you can think about, or your dough rising, right? You can think about what properties of the yeast to make it more Okay, so, oh, I wanted to make one more point, which is why I have it here, is that this um, uh, pyruvate decarboxylase, I'm just putting PD to make it easy, myself is um, not present in muscles and so when you have going to either ethanol or going to lactate usually these are happening in different cells so um, this is not present in muscles and in muscles you get lactate so we'll look at that now so formation of lactate has things in animal tissues like muscles and erythrocytes um, and it's usually heavy use so you'll have this conversion of pyruvate in an NADH-dependent reaction to get lactate. And basically, um, this is a dehydrogenase, as you can see. Uh, it has a nice variance, but like irreversible delta G, right, minus 25. And then this lactate can actually be transported to the liver, and we're going to see in a minute, then it can be metabolized to make more glucose. So we talked about glucose being oxidized via glycolysis to pyruvate, which could go to the TCA cycle, which we have not talked about yet, could go to ethanol or could go to lactate. And then we're going to move on to oxidation via the pentose phosphate pathway. So here, right, you're making pyruvate for these products which ultimately go to ATP and amino acids. Here, these go to nucleic acids and like an ADH does in the So for this part, as you had in the post and lecture, right, you want to know all the enzymes, structures, and reactions of glycolysis, central conserved pathway. That's why. And you want to know the energetics, but you don't have to memorize the three. And actually, this part that we're going to talk about now, where we compare glycolysis to gluconeogenesis, is very helpful in terms of memorizing and thinking about the reactions. And then the part we're moving into now is the second part of what you'll need to know. Okay. So just one second. So most of it comes from glycogen, where it's stored and then can be readily used. But if you're exercising right, really rapidly, 
you actually are using up all of your storage of glycogen and you actually need to be synthesizing some for your brain. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what gluconeogenesis is, is we're going from three carbon precursors, like pyruvate or lactate, to form glucose. So what are the principles of actually forming something, of synthesizing something, or anabolism? Um, one, it has to be different from the degradation, right? Otherwise, we're going to talk about this a little bit. It would be a problem. Also, they have to be controlled differently. And typically, it's the initial step that's controlled. And then whenever you have an energy requiring process, it has to be coupled typically to the breakdown of ATP to make it irreversible. So that's a strategy that we've seen is ATP as um, a way of making something energetically favorable and irreversible. So this is a really critical diagram that you'll want to become very familiar with. So we've talked in detail about glycolysis. Right, glucose going to two pyruvate, so it's on this side, right? So you have 10 reactions here. Only three are irreversible, and they're driving it, right? They have that really nice negative delta G, the hexokinase, the phosphofructokinase, and the pyruvate kinase. So if you're now thinking about gluconeogenesis, where we're going from two pyruvate to glucose, we can use a lot of the same reactions, right? Seven of them are reversible, and they just depend, their delta Gs vary depending upon the concentration of reactants or products. So depending upon which direction you're going, it'll favor one versus the other. But it, biology basically makes use of things that are efficient that doesn't have to reinvent. So in this case, um, you can also go in the reverse direction to make glucose, and you only have to deal with those three reactions, right? I have to get a replacement for this, a replacement for this, and a replacement for this. And you can see that this is the first <coughs> enzyme, so this is highly controlled coming into glycolysis, and then also the final is highly controlled, but we'll just focus on the first one, and then the first one here, right? Being highly controlled. So there's kind of an odd word choice that's used, which is the word bypass. Because you typically think of and learn about glycolysis first, and then these are irreversible, these are considered ways to bypass the irreversible reactions. So when I say bypass, that's how I'm using it. That's consistent with your books and how it's used. <clears throat> so first, let's look at the energetics. Um, so you can see here from this table in your book that um, the standard free energy at pH 7, 1 molar, 25 degrees Celsius is highly favorable for these three irreversible reactions. And then the actual free energy with the concentration of the reactants and products is also highly favorable in terms of being a really nice negative delta G. The others vary. They're pretty close to want zero, or they can be zero, depending on the conditions, and they're reversible, like we said. So I want to point one other thing out. Um, sometimes in your textbook, right, or most of the time in your textbook, it just has delta G, but often I'll have delta G prime just, that just makes it pH 7, right, 25 degrees Celsius. Um, so if you are used on a test or something else and you have delta G or delta G prime, that's okay. Make sure it's distinguished from that zero with the standard. So your textbook basically gets lazy because, I mean, I won't say it's getting lazy, but I just did. So, <laughs> um, because it, it's always talking about biology at this point, right? So it's always at pH 7 at 25 degrees Celsius. All right, so we have to get around these three reactions. There's one here, one here, and one here. And we're gonna start from the bottom with the first bypass, and then the second and the third. So these, again, these are, these, you wanna know each of these reactions as well. So the first one is you're going from pyruvate to oxaloacetate, and then oxaloacetate to phosphoenol pyruvate. So even though we call it bypass one, you might have noticed it takes two enzymes to do it. 
Um, so first, you have this ATP-dependent reaction, and it requires a cofactor of biotin to add on the CO2 group. Again, you don't need to be able to push the electrons if you want to, because it makes it easier for you. That's fine, but you do need to know this transfer, right? So carboxylates putting on that CO2 group, okay? Knowing the names of things really helps. Um, and then you have a acetate, and then basically, instead of ATP, you can also use other um, similar forms, right? So instead of adenosine, it's guanosine, um, but it still has this high energy triphosphate. And so again, you're using that to promote the reaction. And this just has to do with what's available at certain phases, um, parts, certain cells under certain conditions. And in this case, um, uh, we have GTP driving it. And so we have acetate, and this is actually happening um, in the mitochondria, is going to pep carboxylase, sorry, through pep carboxylase, getting rid of the CO2, the same one that came in, is now going off, and you get phosphoenyl pyruvate, or PEP. So now you have that phosphate group here. <laughs> so it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so basically, what you want to know here, right, is we're going from, I just talked about going from pyruvate to PEP. <laughs> so the thing is that, um, we actually need to keep generating NADH in the cytosol for the next part of the gluconeogenesis. It needs NADH. So we don't want to just use it up. We need to generate it. So it goes, pyruvate can actually be transported into the mitochondria. And then you use the enzyme I just talked about, pyruvate carboxylase. It adds carboxylase to CO2 to make oxaloacetate. It cannot be transported. So it gets converted to malate, and you put in NADH, you put it, you actually have this electron transfer here, right? So then malate ends up storing that. It's actually storing this um, reducing power. It has a transporter, it goes out into the cytosol, and then it can be converted back to oxaloacetate. And the mitochondrial, these two enzymes are different, okay? And now you're producing NADH. So what you're doing here, right, is from going from pyruvate to PEP, you're actually also generating NADH in the cytosol. And then the second step is oxaloacetate to PEP, and then the CO2 comes off. So in some cases, like in muscle, right, you actually start with lactate instead of pyruvate. And in this case, the conversion to pyruvate generates NADH. So you don't need to worry about converting it to malate. So basically, the pyruvate goes, I'm using this so much, it's going out. Okay. The pyruvate goes um, into the mitochondria, uses the same enzyme to convert to oxaloacetate. But it, then it uses a different one, pep carboxylase, to take off that CO2. So you can see here it's a mitochondrial pep carboxylase versus a cytosolic, and then it goes to pep. So there are two different strategies that are used to generate ADH, depending upon um, what you have as a precursor, whether you have pyruvate or whether you have lactate. <coughs> So we talked about um, the first bypass, right, which is these two enzymes. So however you're doing it, what you really want to know is that um, you're using these two enzymes, that this is the reaction, and that somehow you have to generate NADH to cytosol. So what about the second bypass and the third bypass? So the second bypass is a bypass of the phosphofructokinase 1. And so here you have fructose 1,6-phosphatase. So the phosphates are in two different positions, plus water to fructose 6-phosphate. So you can see there's no ATP. This is not, right, there's nothing happening with ATP here. You're just losing a phosphate. Whenever you see phosphatase, right, that's actually cleaving off or hydrolysis of a phosphate. 
So again, the enzymes will tell you what the function is. So you're cleaving off this phosphate and you have this nice irreversible reaction. In the second one, you're also doing a similar thing. You have glucose 6-phosphatase, cleaving off the phosphate, nice irreversible reaction, no ATP. So this is not a phosphoryl transfer, this is just hydrolysis. This is a case of hydrolysis. You're actually just getting rid of that phosphate group. And um, this one you might say, well, how could this actually happen, right? Because we know that um, uh, we have cases where, right, we don't want glucose 6-phosphate to go to glucose when we're actually in glycolysis, right, converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. This would just be a circle. So what happens is they're under differential control and they actually only have these enzymes and this function in certain cells and certain tissue. So if we look at it here, right, what I was talking about is you don't want this circling, right? So these happen in different cells under different conditions. So the thing that we want to look at now is just the total situation. So for glycolysis, right, if you follow this series of reactions, you'll see that there are two ATP produced, right, two go in, um, one, sorry, hold my finger, one, two, and then you have four going out. So it's a net two and a net two for NADH. On the other hand, when you're making glucose, it's expensive, right? You put in ATP, you put in GPP, you put in NADH. But there are certain conditions, right, where you need to make glucose, and so it's worth that expense. So let's look at um, that one of these um, situations in terms of making glucose and using glucose. So this was discovered by um, Gertie Corey, and so basically it couples the cycles and you see how they're in different parts of the body. So you have your storage polymer of glucose, which is glycogen. Um, the glycogen that is converted through glycolysis and then your, your final step when you're exercising rapidly to lactate, right by that lactate and hydrogenase. And then the lactate can go into the blood, and then the blood goes down, um, I'm sorry, then the lactate goes down into the liver, and then the liver can use that um, gluconeogenesis to convert lactate to glucose. So even though it's expensive, you need, right, the, breath, the body and the brain needs glucose. So when you're exercising really rapidly, you have to have a way of getting glucose to the brain. And so it will use this energetically costly function to be able to make more glucose. Then that glucose can go back into the bloodstream and then be stored again as glycogen. So that's why like after you run, um, like basically in your textbook they have some nice examples. So if you're like sprinting or if um, you're an alligator and you have like this extreme rapid motion to try to catch something, um, you need a resting period afterwards for those glucose and glycogen to be formed before you can do the strenuous activity again. So I thought at this point you've seen a lot of metabolism, so I thought we would just have a mental break and watch um, Hussein Bolt. So. so this is an example. I think, oh, it didn't switch over. Shoot. Okay, I'm seeing it. I'm sorry. This was supposed to switch. Okay, so um, try something else. You're still not seeing it, huh? Okay. I'm being too tricky now. Oh, it worked in my own lab. Okay. What? Um, actually, I learned this this cool thing, but it's not working for you. Can Switch. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I practiced this. <laughs> All right, let's see. Try it one more time. Okay. It worked. You saw it when you first came in, right? <laughs> All right. Um, okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, if anyone wants to try to help me, really fast, they can. Okay, so I was giving you a break
joy of watching Hussein Bolt run the 100 meter. So in you know just a few seconds, right, he actually is doing that 100 meter sprint, and obviously he's converting his glycogen into, he's using it all up, making lactate, and then he needs to recover. Oh, wait, I'm over. Okay. So I was trying this tricky thing as well. This in the NO3. If only all our classes were like 192. Make a portfolio. Oh, the bio. Oh my god, we gotta start. Today's I know. The There's only 20 days left. Wait, what? What? 25th, dude. Today's the fifth. Oh my god. So right after the exam? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, I'll do after the exam. Hey, we'll get together. We'll work on this. Okay. All right. 20 minutes later. We... <laughs> okay, so but now I'm doing this again. I was trying to avoid this. Um, so go to 154. He's so fast that he is trying to smile at the camera. What? <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe this is nice or Yeah, just stare. <laughs> like, just stare. Okay. So, we can play it I was trying to do this trick so that I don't have to go like the other. Okay. You can't even see his legs in here. Okay. before we move on to the next session and show you something relevant. So eventually, I was trying to do something too tricky and I'm not sure why it didn't work because it worked when I first came in today. Um, so now I'm gonna get back to this other trick. Okay. So now we're moving on to um, continue on to the oxidative enzyme pathway. There we go. We haven't covered it in it, so right. I see. So we just talked about the Cori cycle, and then we just had an example of the Cori cycle, and um, I guess if I'm going to practice this again, I'll have to come back into this room. So now we've talked about right oxidation via glycolysis, um, and then we're going to be talking now more about glucose going to ribose phosphate. So that can be used to make nucleic acid and NADH, and it's done via the pentose phosphate pathway. You might see PPP as an abbreviation. There's some other names for it, but I'm not going to use them. Um, the, the most well-known name is the pentose phosphate pathway. So basically you're producing pentoses and NADPH for biosynthesis. And so why do we actually have this? So essentially, um, it's very active in tissues that require large amounts of NADPH. 
So you need a way, right, of here's the pentose phosphate pathway, and you're taking uh, glucose 6-phosphate, and then you can either go all the way down to ribose 5-phosphate or to nucleotides, coenzymes, DNA, and RNA. So there are two reasons why we have this. Um, one is that if you have really actively dividing cells, you need a lot of nucleotides, DNA, RNA, to make DNA and RNA, um, also to make coenzymes. And so this could be in bone marrow, this could be in skin, which turns over rapidly, and also in tumor cells. So again, you could think about ways of targeting. Um, so just like a lot of cancer drugs, right, they're actually targeting cells that are more rapidly dividing or more active. So again, um, other things are impacted. So that's why like your skin or sometimes like your hair might be impacted with a cancer treatment, but the tumor cells are more sensitive. So the other reason though, there are two really different reasons. So one is the actively dividing cells getting these um, precursors for DNA and RNA, and um, also as we saw from the structures like MAD, um, MADCH. So here, um, you also want it to be very active in tissues that require large amounts of MADCH and like for fatty acid synthesis. So the reason here that you need a lot of MADCH is you can, this pathway, right, provides two MADCHs as it goes through. <coughs> And as it goes through one cycle, it's providing two of these and releasing one CO2. And so you need it to make um, these reductive biosynthesis, like to make fatty acids, it uses a lot of MADPH. But also it's really important for reduction when you have oxidizing conditions. So whenever you're detoxifying something, so whether it's an external agent or whether it's something that um, is actually naturally occurring, you need MADPH to help um, control free radicals and um, to basically um, limit your exposure to reactive oxygen species, including H2O2 and um, hydroxy radicals. So you can see that this is very interconnected to the start of glycolysis, right? The second product of glycolysis is glucose 6-phosphate. So you have to have a way of controlling if something goes through the PPP, oxidative pentose um, phosphate pathway, or whether it goes through glycolysis. And so again, you're gonna have um, really careful control of the first enzyme, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So here, um, you're converting glucose 6-phosphate to this other form right through a dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase highlighted here. And then you're actually converting it through a lactinase, right? So you have this carboxyl group now. And then finally, this arrow goes up here. You're actually converting it with the phosphogluconate, sorry, with the 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase to um, uh, the CO2 comes off, right? And you get this d ribulose case 5 phosphate So you have a ketone there. And then here I was just pointing out that, that you have the aldehyde. <coughs> this is just a nice polymerization to the d ribulose 5 phosphate So for this part, you want to know these steps in the reaction, and they are important. You don't have to push the enzyme, I mean the electrons around, but you want to know right which groups are coming off by which enzymes. So we're going to go through this a little bit more, but right now I'm going to focus on this very beginning part. So I told you that there were two reasons to jet to use this pathway. So right, one is if you have really actively dividing cells, you need a lot of precursors for like DNA and RNA. And then another one is if you need a lot of MADPH to basically degrade a xenotoxic or um, in some of the reductive mechanisms. So one of the diseases that's uh, really common that's caused by deficiency in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is um, called phagism. And uh, this is actually a response to eating a lot of, for certain people, um, eating a lot of, that have a deficiency in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Um, you're eating a lot of fava beans or a lot of falafel, things that are cooked with this, and there's this compound. So plants make a lot of really cool compounds, and this is one of them called divacine. But divacine, when you're catabolizing it, it can actually produce 
highly reactive compounds like H2O2. And usually that detoxification happens through NADPH. So um, through the pentose uh, phosphate pathway. So PP. So if you don't have this highly functioning, because the first enzyme is not functioning at its highest level, you can be more sensitive to this compound in other. And it can actually lead to a number of problems. So it can disrupt membranes, it can lead to anemia, which is called, and like jaundice, um, which is basically called autism. And this is, people have known this for a really long time. And actually in your book, um, there's this whole discussion of how Pythagoras was told not to eat baba beans and really suggested to everyone that you don't eat baba beans because they actually had correlated um, this lack of health and sickness, jaundice, and, and actually you know, can even be fatal with eating baba beans. So the kind of cool thing about it is um, actually as high in certain areas of the world, up to 25% of the population still has uh, mutation associated with reduced glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase activity. Um, so why would this be kept, right, if it's actually not favorable? And the reason is that um, it's favorable for another reason. So in the areas where you have malaria, um, again, when you create something that's a toxic, like H2O2 or a, a OH radical, right, um, when you actually are in the blood cells and then the mosquito is coming in, it is more sensitive to the oxidative stress than you are. So if you just have a little bit of a deficiency, unless you're eating tons and tons of baba beans, it's not an issue for you, or you have another situation where you really need to detoxify something, and another kind of environmental stress. So typically, most people are asymptomatic. They don't have an issue with this. Um, but they'll actually have a positive advantage of, because the um, mosquito and the uh, transmission of malaria, the plasma pneumonium, is actually more sensitive to the oxidative stress than the impact on you in your body through the pentose phosphate pathway. Did I explain that okay? All right. So there are a lot of, so one thing that you'll see with metabolism is that um, many, many, many of the diseases out there are metabolic diseases, and before um, we had kind of the wide availability of vitamins and all the nutrients that we have, and still in many countries, we still have diseases associated with lack of certain cofactors, B vitamins, um, or inability to degrade something. So there's both genetic um, predispositions and then also in terms of their food supply. So, for the eye quicker quiz, you want to be on AA. And, oh, sorry about that. Okay. What was the question? <laughs>
A. Right? So you have the ribose 
5 phosphates. So every square is ribose 5 phosphate. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 coming in. And then you have 5, 6 carbon molecules, which are the um, uh, glucose 6-phosphate coming out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 30 goes to 30. And you're doing, this is the same set of reactions. Like if I split this in half, right, this and this are the same thing. And the reason is you need to have the two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, right, two 3Cs to make that C6 glucose 6-phosphate. And that uses the gluconeogenesis enzyme. So um, looking at these reactions, there's no net reduction or oxidation, there's no phosphoryl transfer, and there's except for one exception, which is in gluconeogenesis. So because you'll have you'll really know these enzymes, you'll have memorized them, you'll actually be able to go right to that enzyme. And I put them here for you. So if we look at gluconeogenesis, right, from the oxidative pathway regeneration. We have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We're doing the isomerization to get the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Then the two of those, right, come together with the aldolates to make fructose 1,6-phosphate. And then we use that fructose 1,6-phosphatase 1 to get to fructose 6-phosphate. This is the only place where that phosphate comes out. And then from here, we have the phosphohexose isomerase to get to glucose 6-phosphate. Okay. So that's how you get the regeneration. And I have one last in the last second. Um, this one is for no grade, but just for your information. So you just looked at the um, non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate cycle. Which one do you think it is? And we'll see if I can get this quicker back. <laughs> Yeah, there it is right there. 